Okay, this lecture is covering the first half of chapter 12. Remember that these lectures are not all-inclusive, do not cover all of your chapter objectives, but I try to hit the high points and explain general concepts that sometimes people find challenging. So the first half of chapter 12 about the endomembrane system focuses on the ER, the Golgi, and the vesicles. Okay. We'll talk just a teeny bit about endosomes, but we will come back to those more in the second half of chapter 12. We'll also bring in peroxisomes in the second half of chapter 12. And the next group of chapters, chapter 19 and 16 that we'll talk about, is focusing on the nucleus and protein translation and targeting. So it's all building, and by the end of this unit, we will have this whole big picture you see in front of you. Just so you know, I like to use pictures um, in addition to your textbook pictures, because I find it, sometimes it's better or easier or helpful if you see a different artist's illustrations, okay? For most of this common stuff, they don't differ too much, but if you're having challenges, sometimes just using Google images to see how other people illustrate a concept is really helpful. One thing I want to bring up is this idea of vesicles. Okay. So your book distinguishes transition vesicles, right? So these would be technically called transition vesicles, oh, darn it, sorry, that go from the ER to the Golgi, and secretion vesicles for transport vesicles that are going to the plasma membrane and secreting the contents. But honestly, a transport vesicle covers them all. Um, so a lot of times you'll just hear me talk, call them transport vesicles um, and not the specific kinds. For me, both are correct. The main concept is that these are small little 3D membrane sacs. Okay. And what's really cool about vesicles and membranes is that a membrane is a membrane. Right? They're all made up of phospholipid bilayers. And so they can pinch off and they can fuse because they're all made of the same components on the outside. What's different is what's on the inside. And so if you're having a hard time picturing this, I like to think of bread dough, right? If you've ever made some dough or silly putty or even play-doh or my daughter's really into slime right now right and you can take this big glob and pinch off a piece and then you can smush it back on there and that's exactly what membranes are doing they're pinching off and they're smushing back together and what we're sharing is we're sharing proteins and lipids on the membrane itself and we're sharing the contents. And remember, the most distinguishing part of a membrane are the proteins that are in it. And we've talked about the protein lipid ratio as giving you an idea to function of a membrane, right? What types of proteins, how many proteins, um, but really what we're focused on in the endomembrane system is this internal membrane system where the membranes are shared and we'll talk about how the membranes can go back the other way. So let's start with the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. This is a continuous, keyword, continuous, continuous membrane network. which means 
the rough ER and the smooth ER are all hooked together. And the reason they draw it 3D is to show you that the inside, the lumen, is the same for the rough and the smooth ER. So they're sharing this inside together. And you can see that physically they look different, right? So here's the rough ER, and it has all these dots that are the ribosomes. And it's usually laid out like this continuous sac, these flattened kind of sacs, but they're continuous, right? This is going to be quite different than the Golgi. The smooth ER appears more tubular, right? So we can see that there's more of these distinct tubes, okay? Part of that is because these are going to pinch off, become vesicles, and transport lipids elsewhere. One of the things I want you to understand is that the smooth ER can become rough ER, rough ER can become smooth ER. So the loss of ribosomes makes the rough ER smooth, and the addition of ribosomes makes the smooth ER rough. So depending upon what the cell is having to do, will regulate the percentage of the ER that is rough versus smooth. So let's talk about the smooth ER. The overall function, no matter what cell type you're in, is to make lipids, steroids, and ultimately membranes. Right? So this is where all your lipids, or primarily the location of your lipids and membranes, um, and steroid biosynthesis. Okay. Different cell types have different functions of their smooth ER. So for instance, in the liver, those cells smooth ER in addition to making lipids and membranes and steroids, can break down glycogen. Okay, so glycogen, you hopefully remember, is a polysaccharide, this big carbohydrate molecule, um, yeah, molecule, I guess, made up of thousands and thousands of glucose molecules hooked together. Okay. In muscle cells, which we're going to uh, get to, I forget what chapter, in a later chapter, um, muscle cells, their smooth ER is actually called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it stores calcium ions for muscle contraction. Okay, so slightly different function in those specific cell types. In your hormone producing glands, right, your smooth ER is going to make the steroids, which one type is hormones, right? So you know one type of steroids is cholesterol, okay? That's gonna be up here in this general function. Some cells are secreting estrogen or testosterone, or cortisol. And so those steroids are made in the smooth ER, and some, in particular, glands. Another specific function of the smooth ER, especially in the liver, but smooth ER in all cells can do this, is what we call detoxification. So the goal here is to take any toxins that enter the body, get them to the liver, 
And then there are a group of proteins called the cytochrome P450 enzymes. One example are the monooxygenases. Right? And what these enzymes do is they add oxygen groups, basically, whoops, sorry, a hydroxyl group to a toxin. And the idea is that that makes the toxin more soluble in water so that the toxin can be flushed out in your urine. Okay. Your book talks about that sometimes the oxidized products are more toxic than the original. We have a test that you will learn about in microbiology uh, oops, or those. Okay, that's not nice. Ames test in microbiology, or you'll learn about it in genetics. And this is a way we test for what the liver is doing to potential toxins. Are they making it more toxic, more carcinogenic? Okay, but for you, for this class, understand that that's another function of the smooth ER, especially in the liver the organ that does most of our detoxification. There are some cool enzymes called flipases. And we've talked about how it's not uh, easy to flip across a membrane, right? Because you have hydrophobic heads, no, sorry, hydro, let me write this, hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic interior and so it's hard to get things across especially to get that hydrophilic head over here so one of the components especially in the smooth ER is this enzyme called flipase and flipase can flip mem um, sorry, flip lipids from here, in this case, the cytosolic side to the lumen of the ER. Now, I've seen this enzyme called flopase that goes from the lumen to the cytosol. We're not gonna get into um, those details, but understand that you need this protein and you need energy. And many times, if a lipid is getting modified, which means getting something like a sugar, say, added onto it, okay, that happens on the cytosol side. Okay, so facing out of the ER, and then the flipase takes it, and we've got sugar, and flips it over to the other side. So remember we talked about a concept called asymmetry. So a phospho, phospholipid bilayer is really made up of what we call two leaflets. Right? So here's a leaflet, here's a leaflet. Asymmetry means these two leaflets can have different concentrations of different types of lipids. And the way we get those lipids back and forth is using an enzyme that requires energy called a flipase. Now, let me go back. This, these um, membranes and lipids that are formed, remember, if we fall all the way back here, Okay, things are going to be able to go to the Golgi, they're going to be able to go to the endosomes and the lysosomes and even the peroxisomes, which we'll talk about um, in another week. So any component of the endomembrane system can get membranes from the smooth ER. Oh, here's the smooth ER way over here, All right? If you are an organelle that is not part of the smooth ER, 
say the mitochondria, to get your phospholipids and to build your membranes, you have to use this phospholipid exchange protein. So what's happening here on the smooth ER is a lipid is being grabbed and then deposited over in the mitochondria and grabbed and deposited over in the mitochondria. So you can imagine how labor intense this is because mitochondria, remember not have only one, but they have two membranes. And when mitochondria divide, they divide like a bacterium. Remember the theory of endosymbiosis. So you've got to transport all these membranes here, grow that mitochondria big, and then let it split. So the smooth ER can um, have a lot of labor going on, especially as a cell is growing or organelles are dividing. All right, so now let's switch to the rough ER. And the rough ER is rough due to ribosomes, right? These big, in case you don't know what a ribosome is, if you don't remember, it's a big RNA and protein complex. And it is the site of protein synthesis, better known as translation. Okay, so translation is the process of reading the messenger RNA material, uh, information I should say, on the ribosome, and bringing in amino acids to make a protein. The ref ER is one site of protein synthesis, not the only site. Okay, so. The reason I told you to look at figure 1922 is because I want you to know that all protein synthesis starts in the cytoplasm or cytosol. I always say cytoplasm, it's technically cytosol. Same difference, I won't mark you off, okay? All of it, and some proteins are completely synthesized in the cytosol. Some proteins have this ER signal sequence, which takes the ribosome and it docks on the rough ER, and protein translation happens on the rough ER. Okay, so all protein synthesis starts in the cytosol, some stays in the cytosol, some moves to the ER, making it rough ER, where translation happens. Okay. Has to have this ER signal sequence. We're going to talk about that in, in the next um, chapter. Another function of the ER is protein folding. Okay, this is not a great diagram of it, but remember that Proteins fold, the amino acids associate into the secondary and tertiary structure based on the amino acid side chains and hydrogen bonding and disulfide bonding and hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions. So protein folding happens, what we call co-translationally, which I might be able to fit on there, co-translationally, which means as translation is happening, the proteins will start to fold. The other thing that's happening in the rough ER is protein modification. And the type that's being shown right here, these little green things, is representing glycosylation. So whenever you see glyco, think sugar, think glucose, so what's happening here is these big sugar chains are being added to the protein, okay? And I want you to see that glycosylation is happening co-translationally, right? So as this protein is being folded and translated, 
you start getting these glycosylations. And I have just drawn all over the picture. The other thing that can happen in the ER is if the protein does not fold correctly, if it doesn't fold correctly, then it will be sent to the cytoplasm. So this is bad folding. I should say incorrect. Protein folding. Okay. Then the protein's shipped off to the cytosol, where a proteasome chops it up back to its amino acids, and we can recycle the components. Two of the most common types of protein modifications, glycosylation, that start in the ER are O-linked and N-linked glycosylation. And I like this diagram a little bit better than the one in your book because what it shows you is in the cytosol, you start building this big oligosaccharide, right? So each of these little hexagons is a sugar. Then you've got to use a flipase to flip that bad boy into the ER lumen. And then here's a ribosome. And nascent means new. So a new polypeptide's being made. And the sugar is added, whoa, to it, which is these little green things, right? So this is, I don't know what I'm hitting. Sorry. This is, oh, where am I? This is co- Co-translation, co-translational glycosylation. How do you like all those? Okay. So, protein modifications actually start in the rough ER. From there, something we call protein trafficking. Um, Proteins have to know where to go. Okay. So your book talks about tags. I've heard them referred to as zip codes. You guys know what that is. Um, or signals, pretty general term. But there is information that tags a protein or a lipid and says, hey, here's where you need to go. So zip codes is a really good analogy because we know when we go to mail something, we have to put the right zip code to get it in the right general location. And then the address and the person that you're sending it to helps get more and more specific. So we're going to focus on proteins, but this happens with lipids too. But for instance, a protein might be made my protein in the ER. And it might have a function to stay there, right? Maybe it was part of, or maybe it's a dicol phosphate, uh, phosphate that needs to stay there, okay? And one of the signals you need to recognize is the RXR, which means arginine, some amino acid arginine, and that protein will stay in the ER, so it's a retention signal. Another protein might be made that has a mannose, I'm going to put M6P, mannose 6 phosphate tag. That says you need to go to a lysosome. So that protein will follow whoa, secretion pathway through the Golgi and eventually we're going to call this a lysosome. Okay. So as the protein is being trafficked, the tag tells it where to go. There may be a secretion signal that says, all right, you're going to go to the plasma membrane. You may have a protein with a KDEL signal. And those 
four amino acids say, go back to the ER. To ER. So we're keeping it really simple in this class. If you took a um, higher level protein biology class, you would learn all about these different codes or um, tags that are put on to tell the protein where to go, where the final destination is, how to move through the cell. And you can see all those transport vesicles taking things to where they need to go. One really important concept that I want you to be able to visualize is this idea that, say this is a vesicle from the ER and the Golgi. Okay. And we made a transmembrane protein and we put a big sugar on it. So the inside of this vesicle, oh, that just drives me crazy. Oops. Inside of vesicle is equivalent to the lumen of the ER, the lumen of the Golgi, right? And we saw way back here where in the lumen is where you're getting those sugars put on. Okay, This membrane right here we're going to say is the plasma membrane. And so when the vesicle hits the plasma membrane the color coding is helping you see that the inner leaflet is going to become the outside of the plasma membrane. So if I draw my protein again with my sugar you can see that that's now going to be on the outside of the cell. Okay, so this is outside. This is the cytosol. Okay. This is another nice picture showing how these membranes fuse together. Okay. So this is how we get proteins on the plasma membrane especially for something like cell signaling, or maybe your transporter proteins, or your porins, right? your channel proteins. So those are coming, being made in the ER, traveling through the Golgi, getting all their modifications, and being um, final destination plasma membrane. Understand that there are two general types of movement. Anterograde is in the green here, and that means to the plasma membrane. PM is plasma membrane. Okay. Retrograde here is backwards. Right. So a protein with a um, KDEL signal is going to go retrograde back to the ER. Something that's being secreted is going to go enterograde. Keep this in mind because when we talk about the cytoskeleton we're going to talk about certain proteins that move these little vesicles in the enterograde or the retrograde direction. So now we're moving on to the Golgi. And this actually may be a slightly better picture. And what I want you to know about the Golgi as compared to the ER, where you can see it's just this continuous, these are individual sacs. So the Golgi is a stack of sacs. And they're flattened, right? they're not tubular like the smooth ER. But they're also not continuous with each other. And that's because the different parts of the Golgi have different functions. 
So the cis Golgi is going to have different functions, say different protein modification functions than the medial and different than the trans Golgi. So the function of the Golgi is again protein and lipid, but we're focusing on protein modifications, packaging, and sending things off to their destinations in the cell. So some people like to describe it as the UPS, right? Reads the zip code, packages it, sends it off into the right truck to get to the right spot. Okay. By definition, the cis Golgi is closest to the ER. Okay, and here's your transition vesicle arriving from the ER, right? So we're going enterograde. You've got transport vesicles budding from the trans Golgi network, which means it's closest to the plasma membrane. Okay, again, if they're going this way, enterograde. Okay. And again, we're not going into the details of what um, each sac of the Golgi does, but know that they are separate because they have separate functions. The modifications that happen in the Golgi are considered post-translational because the protein has already been made, it's already been released from the ribosome, translation is over. And I just throw up this figure here so that you know it's more than just glycosylation. You can have phosphorylation, you can have methylation, you can have hydroxylation, you can have the disulfide bonds being formed, you can have lipids put on, you can have lots of different stuff done for post-translational modifications. And again, these different components would be done in different sacs of the Golgi stack. One of your objectives says understand that modifications are important but not necessarily structure equals function. And I want you to know that you can have a protein folded, which we call structure, and then these modifications put on. So the modifications aren't affecting the physical structure, but they are directing the function. Okay, when we talk about cell signaling and receptors more, um, you'll, we'll, we'll revisit this idea. Okay, two more slides and we are done. Um, I just want to bring up the concept of endosomes because it's talked about. Um, in this case, we're talking about the relationship between endosomes to lysosomes. And hopefully you remember that lysosomes are the digestive sacs so they have these things called acid hydrolases, which means in a very acidic environment, they hydrolyze, which remember we talked about, or you should remember from general biology, hydrolysis is the way to break down polymers to monomers, right? So this is a breakdown reaction. So the lysosomes are breaking down um, components in the cell kind of a recycling, digesting um, thing. Uh, we're going to come back to this in the second half of the chapter. Just know that these are all connected to the endomembrane system. And here, remember that because we're talking about tags, the mannose 6-phosphate is the tag that tells the um, endomembrane system that these proteins go to the lysosome. Okay. So just in summary, we've got the endomembrane system. Okay, we've talked about the ER, we've talked about the Golgi, we've talked about these vesicles. We'll talk more about the lysosomes and the endosomes. But there can be lots of different destinations, right? Shown in red and blue. Um, 
we've talked about enterograde, and we've talked about retrograde movement. Okay, this diagram is, um, whoops, not color coded as um, well. But just understand that it's a really complex system, but what it is, is an internal endo membrane system where these membranes come from one location, can go to another location, but they can also come back. All right, I hope that helps you with the first half of chapter 12. Ooh.